do. Well, welcome everyone. We're going to get started. The Open Textbook Network is proud to announce monthly one hour webinars at 1 p.m. Central on the last Monday of each month. Today is our first of such offerings. These webinars are open to everyone and will feature uh, Open Textbook Network members discussing strategies that have helped them build and sustain their open ed initiatives. All webinars will be recorded and shared and presenters will be OTN members. We also really welcome your suggestions for future webinar, to webinar topics. Um, so now I have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Karen Lauritsen, Director of Publishing for the Open Textbook Network, who will talk to us today about the Open Textbook Library. So thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Tanya. I am going to say hello to everyone as a visible human. Um, most of you have your cameras off, um, and I'm going to turn mine off shortly for the slideshow portion. Um, but I just wanted to uh, say hello and have a little eye contact, as it were. Okay, I'm still here, uh, and I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to first make this, maybe I should have done that first. Okay, can somebody please give me a verbal confirmation that they see a title slide? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. All right, so we're off to the races. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Lauritsen. I'm Publishing Director with the Open Textbook Network. We are based at the University of Minnesota. And today I'm going to talk with you about the Open Textbook Library and I hope hear from you about how you use the library and ideas you may have for making the library more usable for our primary audience, which is um, potential faculty adopters. So um, as publishing director, my purview is maintaining the library as well as developing publishing support for our members, which can take many different forms. I won't dive into that too much today, but I will just point out uh, the relationship that I enjoy between those two areas, which is, um, you know, supporting our members in the very first stages of, of developing an open textbook publishing program, all the way through to potentially seeing the fruit of their labor in the open textbook library. So I'm happy to help you with anything um, throughout that process. So first, just uh, a quick overview for any of you who may not be open textbook network members yet. Um, I think already these numbers are just a little outdated, but we have more than 120 members um, and they together are working at more than 1100 institutions, uh, primarily throughout the United States. We are funded through the Hewlett Foundation, other grants and annual community fees. And while I know um, it's exciting to think about, you know, the size of these numbers, I also like to point out that these numbers are representing people doing the work at institutions, uh, state systems, and library consortia. And it's really um, the people who are working together to move our, our goals forward. Um, this is a, a, an older, um, what is this? A, not quite a graph, but uh, illustration. I just want to explain we're based at the University of Minnesota, although Sarah and I work remotely from California. And then our executive director, Dave Ernst, is in the College of Education and Human Development, where there's the Center for Open Education. So we kind of have these three layers. Um, but you'll notice here that nobody is a vendor. We are based in at a higher ed education institution. And then in 2012, the Open Textbook Library started. And then in 2014, the Open Textbook Network started. And those two gray arrows pointing between the library and the network are really meant to represent their very close relationship, which I'll touch on a little bit as we go along today. So what is the OTN about? Um, we are really about the big picture and uh, the long game, much like these Redwoods. Um, we're working together to make higher education more open. And we do have guiding principles that our community is organized around. You can see those listed there. And if you'd like to dig a little deeper into what those mean to us, you can find information on our about page. So now about the library. You can find the library at open.umn.edu slash open textbooks. 
And if you were to go there, uh, you would land on a home page that looks uh, something like this. You'll notice the single search bar at the top, which is meant to make things easy for our faculty users. You'll notice on the bottom, um, the subject listing, the new books column listing. As soon as a new book is entered into the library, it shows up here on the home page. And then you'll also notice a newer feature in the bottom right called in development. And that's information about open textbooks that are currently being written or in the uh, publication process. And this information is entered directly by our members. So you'll see there at the University of Arkansas, they're working on an open textbook called Moving Pictures and Introduction to Cinema, which sounds great. So let's look at the basics. Um, I am just going to give you an aside and say that uh, for a while, I have been thinking about uh, having a dog. And by for a while, I mean like 10 years. And so even though I have never quite gotten there, um, I will perhaps uh, pepper this presentation with some very fine looking uh, canine companions. So this dog is wondering why a textbook? Why have we um, built so much of our strategy around textbooks? And really the, the answer is because faculty are already familiar with the textbook adoption process. So we're not trying to have a conversation about open as a concept, or what open education means for the future of our society. Those are really difficult starting points, but a starting point in terms of, hey, you are familiar with the textbook adoption process. We have another option for you, a different type of textbook. And so they're already grounded in that point of reference. So why an open textbook library? Well, um, many of you I'm sure are familiar with the Babson report and a couple of key obstacles in open ed in terms of um, trying to grow awareness has been a perceived lack of offerings. So by having an open textbook library, we're really trying to show faculty across disciplines, hey, you've got a lot of op options here. There is a lot on offer. Check it out, see if something can work for you. So that was really the thinking about um, an open textbook library and, and how things got started. So I'm gonna focus the conversation around the open textbook library in two different areas. The first area, of course, perhaps most obviously, is that the library is a resource. It's available to anyone around the world. You don't have to be a member to access it. You don't have to be a member to contribute a book to it. It's really out there for the common good. And, and, and the goal is to be a comprehensive referatory. And referatory means we're pointing to where those books live out there in the vast internet universe. We don't keep the books. Um, we're not you know, stewards of those files. Um, whoever published those books really are. And then we're pointing traffic. We're pointing people so that um, we can help you grow awareness for the efforts that you've done in publishing something. And then the second area that I'm going to talk about the library in is the strategic area and how the library fits into the faculty workshop that many of our members have run on their campuses. And really the, the goal with those workshops is to connect faculty to open options. So first, let's just look a little bit more closely at the library as a resource. There are four criteria for inclusion in the open textbook library. The first is that it must be openly licensed so that uh, someone can edit the textbook. There must be one complete portable file. So sometimes I'll see publishers have made every chapter, for example, available independently. That's great, but we also need one file that has every chapter in that single file. And that's really so that students can access and download one file when they have a reliable internet connection and take it with them. The book must be affiliated uh, with a scholarly society or an institution or used in more than one location. So for library publishing programs that decide to support um, an open textbook uh, creation, this would meet that third criteria. And then finally, the fourth criteria is that the textbook needs to be an original publication or the book of record. We're not pointing to all of the many adaptations that we hope are out there mainly because we want to keep things streamlined for new faculty users. If they were to browse and find, you know, 45 adaptations of Introduction to Algebra, 
it's really a lot of work to try to discern, you know, oh, this one has chapter three here, and this one moved chapter three into chapter 12. Um, and these, these sort of finer tunings um, we, we think would complicate things. So we have the original, unless it's for an entirely new audience. So algebra for dog walkers would be an example. Um, not a very good example, but you know, tailoring that initial content for an entirely new audience that may need um, new considerations uh, in, in the book. Less defined in the criteria that you'll find in the library is that the textbook needs to support an entire course. So Tom, sometimes I'll receive suggestions to add something to the library and it might be a short guide, for example, or an anthology. And those, of course, are very valuable open educational resources, but they're different from a textbook. The same is true of monographs. And this is when things can get a little bit tricky in terms of deciding, hmm, is this a good fit for the library? And I'm always happy to have this conversation and learn more about the book and how it might be used in the classroom. But I would just like to point out here, um, you will see a screenshot. This is from the open textbook publishing curriculum. It's open for everyone. It's a Canvas course. If you go to z.umn.edu build book, you will go directly to this unit about developing a textbook structure. And um, that's another place where, you know, my role in managing the library fits in with supporting publishing programs. We really are looking for something like you see on the right, the biology textbook from OpenStax, which has, as you'll see, illustrations, it has a chapter outline, it has key points, it has these pedagogical devices that set it apart from a monograph and make the student learning experience a bit different. How is criteria developed? Again, uh, you've already heard me say with that faculty user top of mind, we do also consult with the steering committee. We are also thinking about how open education is changing and moving into the future and things including the criteria can change. In the beginning, when the library was started in 2012, we did accept Creative Commons licenses with the ND or no derivatives clause. And we no longer do because it's not open. It doesn't allow for editing. And when we made that decision, I reached out to every author and publisher who had a no derivatives book in the library. I told them of the change. I said why we're making a change and encouraged them to consider a more open license. A couple did, a couple didn't, but we kept those books in the library. However, we no longer accept no derivatives. The library and the resources in there are of course a way to introduce the Creative Commons licenses to faculty users. Again, having that familiar point of reference of the textbook. And then of course, uh, having a uh, license that allows for derivatives lets us do things like create an entirely new version for an entirely new audience. So here's collaborative statistics written by Barbara Alowski and Susan Dean, an open textbook that was in the library that someone adapted specifically for spreadsheets and people who use spreadsheets. And so after some analysis, it was decided this textbook derivative is unique enough and for a new audience that it too will be added to the library. So what's in there today? Uh, almost 700 textbooks. You can always see the exact number on the homepage. I really appreciate suggestions for new textbooks to add to the library. You can drop me an email or I'll give you a link to a form. The subjects are mostly organized by the World Library's outline of academic disciplines. Books may be listed in more than one subject and the menu can also show the number of books per subject. Now I can see that there's some um, conversation in the chat. I can't see what that conversation is yet, but I just want to assure you that I will leave time to address any questions that may be in there. Okay, here we are back on the homepage of the library. That blue arrow is pointing to the somewhat discreet place where you can see the number of textbooks in the library at any time that you choose. That's automatically updated. This is where, if uh, screen capture allowed it, you would see a number after the uh, subject dropdown. So if you were to do this live, um, human resources, there might be a number 31 after it, telling you that there's 31 textbooks in that particular area. 
Now let's flash back to September 9th, 2016 with our old logo. Uh, there were 291 books in 11 subjects um, not too long ago. And you can see here that engineering was an entirely new subject area. That's because we reached the tipping point of six. That's generally when we um, go ahead and, and open up a new subject area if, if it's warranted. And then compare this to today, uh, where now we have 14 subjects, including medicine, which is new. So things are growing, which really reflects all of the work and effort that people are putting in uh, across the open education community, and it's really exciting. As I mentioned, I really appreciate suggestions at any time. If you would like to suggest a book and you think it's a good fit for a library, for our library, um, please let me know. And even if you find a book and maybe something isn't quite right, but you think it would be really valuable to start a conversation with the author or publisher, um, I can do that too. So how do you know what's in there beyond the search bar and subject dropdown? Uh, we do have live cumulative MARC and CSV records. And since August have been working very closely with OCLC to get our MARC records in shape so that they'll be included in their community. Um, we previously worked with Colorado State on hand cataloged records, but that was not sustainable for the long term. We couldn't continue to ask Alicia Conradi there to do that. And so Andy Seroff, who's a developer on the UMN team, develop these live records, which will always reflect what's been added up to the minute. And so now we're just working on the structure of those records and, and cleaning them up so that they'll um, be a good fit for OCLC. And I'm really excited about that. I think in the next month or two, we should um, have that up and running. There is where you will find our discovery page <clears throat> and all of the records for downloading. So this adorable dog wonders, where do books come from? They come from a variety of places, uh, library publishers, funded initiatives like OpenStax, which is another Hewlett grantee, independent authors. Um, these are sometimes faculty who are retiring and want to leave something behind, or new faculty who see that there's a financial issue for students and want to provide them with a free resource. Uh, discipline collectives are starting to develop um, open textbooks, which is really great to see. Um, they can come from a variety of sources, and they are, as you've seen by the way we've grown the library, they are coming in um, fast and furious. Here's an example of a book record. We're just going to take a look at one. You can see that there is one review for The Art of Being Human by Michael Wesch. Um, published at uh, New Prairie Press, which is a Kansas State University Press. And this book is available in multiple formats, as you can see from that orange button. If you were to click on that, it would take you directly to where those formats are available. The author has chosen to share the work with a CC BY non-commercial share-alike license. And then you can see information about the book at a glance, table of contents, a brief description, and then um, you can't see it on the screen, but at the bottom there would be a bio about the author. And all of that information is pulled directly from what New Prairie Press shares in their institutional repository or wherever the author or publisher has made the files available. That's where we're getting that information from. So it's always really helpful to include um, that metadata when posting open textbook files. Now, understandably, there may be some worry. Okay, you're a referatory, you're pointing to where these things live, but what if they disappear? Things do disappear on the internet. Well, there is a dark archive in place, just in case, um, and that is thanks to our Colorado State University libraries. It happens very rarely. Maybe in the few years I've been managing the Open Textbook Library, I can think of two incidents in which we had to point to um, the DSpace archive for the files. So it's rare, but we're still, we still have that insurance policy just in case. Okay, so that was the library as a resource at a glance. And now I'm gonna shift just a little bit and talk about the library as part of the larger open textbook network strategy. And that is of course to connect faculty to open options. 
So just very briefly, I know so many of you have firsthand experience with the faculty workshop strategy, but it is briefly, you know, define the problem. What, what are students facing financially um, and in terms of their learning that open textbooks might be able to help with? What are our goals as a society in wanting to provide an accessible education? Really kind of thinking together about what the problem is and then defining open textbooks and how they may be able to help. Um, talking about open licenses, talking about how that will allow for adaptation and editing and open pedagogy. And then finally, giving faculty some actionable steps um, for what they can do if they're interested in exploring open. So what can faculty do? Well, um, faculty, of course, can take a look at the open textbook library. They can write a review as part of the workshop program that open textbook members implement. And they can, of course, adopt a book if they decide that a book meets their needs or the needs of their student or closely meets their needs and they can edit it. And then, of course, faculty can raise awareness among their colleagues and their program and department. So those actionable steps are um, really rooted in the open textbook library. In terms of writing a review, um, incentives are paid to Open Textbook Network member faculty when they attend a workshop and review a textbook in the Open Textbook Library. That review now, uh, this is a, an improvement in the last year or so, that review instantly appears. So when faculty write a review for a book in the OTL and they press submit, they can immediately see, oh, there it is. There's my review appearing with the book record. 73% of the collection is faculty reviewed, and that number is pretty much the same, even back in the day when we had 200 and something books in the library, and now as we're approaching 700 books in the library, because the Open Textbook Network has been growing so much, um, that number has stayed the same, which is really pretty great. Let's say plus or minus um, 5%. This is the criteria for reviewing an open textbook. It was adapted from our colleagues at BC campus. And you can see here that this is not, you know, a rigorous peer review um, that might be true of a journal article. It's really more of an at a glance type experience where faculty are evaluating the comprehensiveness, the accuracy, how long the, the content would be relevant the clarity of the writing, um, the consistency in terms of terminology and framework. And I'll just draw a connection again here in terms of consistency with the work that I do on the publishing side and that our members do on the publishing side in terms of thinking about always using the same term throughout the book. You know, when, when we work in our disciplines or our areas of expertise, we might have three words that we use meaning roughly the same thing where for a student learner, that can get confusing. So really thinking about the consistency of that textbook. Modularity, um, I also talked about in the beginning how monographs are different from textbooks. Um, textbooks, I would argue, often um, are more modular. You can um, think about moving pieces around a little bit more easily. Um, uh, faculty reviewers will look at organization, structure, flow, interface, Good old grammatical errors, which of course a copy editor or proofreader can help with in the publishing process. And finally, cultural relevance. And of course we aspire not only to produce something that isn't insensitive or offensive, but something that's actually inclusive and inviting for all sorts of different kinds of learners um, and communities. Now these numbers I can tell you are dated because we have many more reviews in the library now. However, I'm sharing this graph with you because the distribution of reviews remains consistent as well. Most faculty think that the open textbooks in the library look pretty good um, at 4.0 or more. And then a smaller um, contingent thinks that they're okay. And then of course there are always a few that are um, kind of stinkers or did not meet the expectation of the faculty who were reviewing those books. 
So the library now also fits in with two new features available to Open Textbook Network members, and that is the data dashboard and the community hub. And I'm going to touch on both of those very briefly um, and say that, you know, under the hood, behind the scenes, all of these three things, <clears throat> excuse me, are built on the same back end. They talk to each other, they have a relationship with each other. Um, the library, in fact, in the last year, moved from one, um, one built environment to another. And this was the work of Andy Seroff, who I mentioned earlier. He's also the, the person who got our live mark records going. So these are very interrelated um, uh, features of the um, open textbook network. So today, of course, uh, we were originally going to be joined by Karen Pakula, so I would like to give this as a shout out to Karen. Uh, I hope she is feeling better. Um, she and her colleague, Kimberly Johnson, talked about what the data dashboard has meant for them. They're responsible for managing the faculty workshop and review process for more than 9,000 faculty at their 37 state colleges and universities. And the data dashboard is designed to help people just like them to streamline the process and make it easier for them to schedule those workshops, see how signups are going, and manage all of the communication follow-up after that workshop. So the data dashboard is really a tool for implementing the program. And then of course, a, a, a major part of that program is collecting those reviews. And instead of each person having to send email after email, uh, trying to friendlyly, friendlyly, that's not a word, to remind people in a friendly way that they may want to submit a review, the data dashboard will do that automatically for them. And then once the faculty member gets that automatically generated email, clicks on the link, submits their review, that of course is showing up in the open textbook library. So it's really exciting for us that we now have a system that is connecting these different parts of everyone's open education work. So I'm really excited um, to end in just a few moments and hear from you about your ideas for the Open Textbook Library. I can tell you what we're thinking about. And one of those things is direct records management. So I wouldn't be the one or Jared, my student assistant, wouldn't be the one necessarily entering data for new books in the library. Instead, authors and publishers could have control of the records themselves. We would give them best practices. There might be some kind of quality assurance process, but everyone would be able to get in there as a community resource and manage it together. So we're thinking about how that might work. This is a glimpse of that under the hood back end. So this is where Jared or I enter book information for um, what you see in the library. And as you can see, it's all very straightforward. And I don't think it would be difficult for anybody to you know, come in here and change an ISBN number if needed, or um, you know, update to a new edition or what have you. We've also already moved in this direction with the textbooks in development feature. I pointed that out to you when we were looking at the homepage of the Open Textbook Library. It was down in the, the lower right hand corner. And I mentioned that it was our members who were entering this data. And um, this was really inspired by the community. It's something we heard them asking for. And we had one of our OTN working groups explore the possibilities of how it could work. Um, at the time, we called it the publishing pipeline, but now it's called in development. And it really serves to highlight members who have publishing programs and what they're working on. So you can see here in my, in my screenshot on the left, uh, someone from Oklahoma got in there and, and entered four textbooks that they're working on in their publishing program. And they can choose the information that they want to share. For example, um, there is a field for expected publication dates. And some people might feel like, oh, that feels like a commitment. I'm not sure how it's going to work out. Um, publishing infamously uh, has very fluid deadlines. And so each member can decide you know, what they want to share about the textbook that's in development. But this is a really um, exciting development and it's something that has been um, working well. In fact, in the last few weeks, uh, two members brought textbooks from the in development um, field 
into this is published and finished and in the library field. So it's been nice to see, um, see that working. This is a glance at the Open Textbook Network Community Hub. This is an area that our members have access to. Um, you can see there on the left in resources, if they were to click on any of those fields, they would find templates, tools, videos, program building blocks, as you can see there, that members have created and shared with an open license and that can be adapted. And then in the library portion, you can see how many textbooks are there, what's in development, you can see that, uh, that reviewed number, and then of course the textbook in development. Now this is my screenshot, so it's a little bit more robust since I'm an administrator, but I wanted to share it with you so you had a sense of the community hub and what's there and how it fits together with the library and the dashboard. So in addition to um, allowing authors and publishers to edit their own records and create and manage their own records, we're also looking at creating more connections. So um, finding author collaborators, finding peer reviewers during the publishing process, um, connecting faculty adopters with authors, perhaps for sharing feedback, and maybe developing adaptation communities. And Finally, um, looking towards creating ancillary development groups and connecting ancillaries to the book records. This is happening informally. Um, if I hear of ancillaries from any of you, and again, I really welcome um, your, your emails and getting in touch with me to let me know what's out there. If I hear about ancillaries for an open textbook that's in the library, we do add now a link to them. Um, but coming up with kind of a more formal uh, process for that is also on our agenda. So that concludes my presentation about the Open Textbook Library. I very much look forward to your questions and suggestions for the library. If you would like to drop me an email, I'm at kloritz at umn.edu. We also have an Open Textbook Library quarterly update email and you can sign up for it at z.umn.edu slash library email, excuse me, library mail. And then finally, if you're not an OTN member and you would like to join us and learn more, there is a form, otn.cehd.umn.edu slash contact. If you fill out that form, my colleague Sarah Cohen will be in touch and let you know about what's involved in joining the OTN. So I'm going to um, go ahead and stop my slide share and turn on my video so that we can talk to each other um, as humans. I welcome you to turn on your video as well. I'm looking at the chat to see if I've missed Anything, I'm glad so there was some dog appreciation. <laughs> Any questions or suggestions? You guys are, um, I know, supporting faculty users and our users yourselves, so I really value your firsthand experience with the library and I'm very open to your, um, your feedback. Okay, Duren, Karen, could you say a little more about the MARC records? Our consortium is interested in making these records available to our libraries. Sure, and I will also put a link in the chat where you can find those records. I'm just pulling it up now. So these records are CC0, um, so anyone can come to the discovery page at any time and download the records and they will be as up to date as that moment. There used to be a delay where there would be, you know, maybe a dozen books in the library, but the records would not have yet caught up with them. And that's one of the really nice features about having live records is that um, now it's completely up to date. 
Um, there is no notification process, but I can assure you, Rebel, that uh, new books are added to the library almost every week. So I recommend that people make a schedule that works for them, perhaps bi-monthly, you know, every Wednesday, um, just checking in and, and um, downloading the records. There'll be something new there. Thanks for your questions. You can also unmute if you like. Jody is asking the relationship between the OTN, the OTL, and the Rebus community. Thanks, Jody, for your question. So the Open Textbook Library is supported by the Open Textbook Network. As you can see, they can add textbooks in development. They are the ones leading the way within the faculty workshop and getting um, faculty reviews posted. And then those community fees that I mentioned in the beginning, they really support the ongoing maintenance of the open textbook library. So the OTN and the OTL are, um, are like this. They are um, completely intertwined. The Rebus community is a valued partner working in the publishing space, and they have um, a kind of a hub where people can find one another to work together on open textbooks. And um, we work with them on a monthly basis to host office hours. And uh, I think we have one coming up on Thursday about peer review. So we work closely together on those on a monthly basis. You'll also see that um, the Rebus community has been evolving into uh, the Rebus Press, I believe, although you'd have to talk with them to get the, the latest information. But you'll see Rebus community created publications in the OTL, just like you saw a Kansas State publication in the OTL, or you might see something from an independent author. Jody, I hope that answers your question, but if you have anything more, please um, chime in. Justin asked, will the publisher, excuse me, will the platform be changing to accommodate publisher submitted metadata or will, will it look roughly the same? Justin, I think it will look roughly the same. If you have anything in mind um, or a specific need, please say more. But we did do a, a very recent update to the OTL, so I think we're gonna be building that out. But changes are always possible, as I mentioned in working with OCLC, for example, We've had to pull out the addition statement, which used to previously appear in the, in the title field. Now the addition statement needs its own field. So we are always um, making changes. Karen asked if my slides will be available. And yes, as Tanya said, the webinars are recorded and I'm happy to make the slides available as well. Rebels asking, I feel like I know a lot about the review process but with stakeholders, this seems to be less transparent for them. How can we make this more transparent? Rebel, can you say more? I would love to hear um, the sticking points. Yeah, so I've had um, people who have even gone through the train the trainer sessions afterwards um, kind of are like, well, how does it, you know, how do, there's no page, I think, to go back to for them that's open to the public that kind of walks through that process or not one that they have readily available. So it kind of shows um, what the steps are for the review process, who's allowed to submit. I think that's on the website somewhere, but um, I don't know, I feel like maybe that's what they need is maybe a web page that they can point because I think a lot of it is they're talking to faculty after they leave and they need something hard, concrete to point them back to beyond like slideshows, right? So mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I hear what you're saying. It sounds like almost having a, a next steps type um, at a glance with, with, the, with the review because right now it's within that sort of automated communication system in the data dashboard. And so it may not um, be as apparent to everyone what's coming down the pike. Gotcha. Okay, well, um, Tanya and Sarah, I think are also in this call with me. So we will put our heads together and think about um, how that could be more clear for faculty and more explicit between um, the workshop hosts and the faculty who are submitting those reviews. 
to Rebel's comment um, also, I do sometimes uh, get questions about, you know, hey, I want to submit a review, uh, particularly from authors and publishers who've written a book. They, they um, you know, want reviewers, of course, to take a look. And that is something that's limited to OTN members. Um, so even though the OTL is available as a, as a common good resource for anyone uh, with an internet connection, reviews are limited to OTN members. And that's because you know, there is overhead and upkeep involved in um, posting reviews and hosting those workshops. And so it is a member benefit. Thanks very much for your feedback, Rebel. Oh, and Sarah put a link for you there um, that might also address um, what, you're, what you're thinking about. So if there are more questions for me, I would like to post some to you as um, open textbook library users, I think. Um, if you were to prioritize some of the things that I talked about at the close in terms of um, you know, finding peer reviewers. For example, I was just talking with Ray, um, I think that was last week, Ray, and you said, you know, what, how can you support our publication process in terms of, of um, matching peer reviewers for books that we're working on? And so that's something, you know, there are more than 5,000 faculty who have reviewed a book in the library and potentially that's a wide community who might be able to be involved in peer review, which is also something our partners at Rebus community are involved in. So thinking about peer review, thinking about managing your own records, thinking about uh, making a more interactive space, for example, connecting people who want to work on ancillaries for a particular book. Of those three things, peer review, managing your own records, and making connections between um, users or building communities around books. Which ones do you guys see the greatest need for or would you be most excited about? Hi. Hi, Elaine. So um, two things have happened recently. We've heard from some administrators that um, compensating people for reviewing books is a problem. I'm mm. in New York State, um, probably because we have a compensation structure. And then without compensating them, they don't take the time to go on a Rebus project or do group work for ancillary. So I'm a little stuck. I, I, I know it doesn't answer your question, but I'm a little stuck in how to promote mm -hmm. within my ranks. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I think the success of the faculty workshop has been that a stipend is paid. <laughs> and so when that is an obstacle, um, there's some creativity, some creative thinking that needs to happen. I don't know, Tanya or Sarah, if you'd like to weigh in. Yeah, thanks, Karen. This is Sarah. Oh, hold on. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Sarah uh, Cohen. I'm the Senior Managing Director at the OTN, in case we haven't met before. Um, it's a really great uh, point, Elaine, and you're not alone. A lot of people go through that challenge. I will say that one of the things that we recommend to people is if money is not available as one of your options, there are alternative approaches to incentivizing faculty. Um, and so some of those that we've seen being successful um, would be having a letter that um, goes into faculty members dossiers. Um, so it could be from your dean, it could be even from your provost or your president or your board of regents, depending on your structure and what's available to you. But something that then acknowledges the efforts that they're making to make education more open and equitable. And the added benefit to that is then they have the opportunity to talk about that during the tenure process because it's in their dossiers, which tackles a whole other aspect um, to kind of codifying open education within academia. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that I would say is um, we do find that some campuses have a hard time paying faculty members that uh, stipend, but another option might be to explore how internal funds can be used internally. So for example, I was at an institution where you couldn't give faculty members that $200 stipend, but you could give them a gift certificate to the bookstore because that was 
kept within internal funding. So it's that kind of, um, I hate to say backdoor, but it might be really creative approaches to um, incentivizing. The last thing I'll say on that, and then I'll be quiet because I see a lot happening in the chat, is that that's a great question to put to your colleagues that are in this call. If you're in the OTN, on the Google group, our community of practice, or in the Libo OER um, listserv, I think that would also be a great space to hear from a lot of other people. You are not alone. There's lots of people that tackle that problem. Yeah, and to Sarah's point about asking the community and asking your colleagues, April did mention in the chat that they're looking at certificates and acknowledgement letters as a possible incentive. Thanks, Sarah. And thank all of you for chiming in on your priorities, what you would prioritize. It seems that the top priority would be to help faculty connect across institutions around the topic of open ed. Um, that's what Gettysburg College uh, said. And then um, Jody kind of had the, the very popular ranking of uh, making communities around books first then peer review, then managing records. I really, really value hearing from you, so thank you. And if anyone um, wants to chime in or has a different priority, it's not too late. I'm pausing for other possible questions or unmuting of microphones. So, um, this is this is Jody, and I just wanted to make a comment, and that is that I made that ranking in that order because when I talk to faculty about open textbooks, sometimes the biggest complaint I hear is that, oh, the textbook is nice, but there's there's no homework to go along with it. There's no there's just no ancillary materials. So, right. I I've, I've just heard that so frequently that I think that making those ancillaries around textbooks is is probably one of the biggest priorities. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think peer reviewing is next because that's the other thing that faculty really, really value. For me, managing records is not that important because at my institution, we're not publishing textbooks. Mm -hmm. um, if we were, then managing records might go up. Um, but, you know, and maybe that's something we would do um, in the future. But anyway, I just thought I'd add that context. Thank and you. it's easier to say it than try to type all that. That's for sure. Thanks, Jody. I agree and I hear you and managing records is not quite as exciting as uh, the other two possibilities as well. And I think, you know, where the managing records comes in is um, kind of thinking back to that image of, of the Redwood Forest and the long game and how we're all going to work together as a community to solve our own problems. You know, we're not a vendor. It's not me, Sarah, Tanya or other central staff who, you know, um, make everything happen. It's, it's all of you on the ground working together to make things happen. So with that sort of ethos in mind, thinking about um, how this resource, the OTL, can really be managed by and provided to the common good. So that's the spirit behind um, managing records as well as, of course, sustainability and, and giving everybody sort of that autonomy. Exactly. I'm going to add, um, since somebody mentioned the Rebus community, um, we are having our office hours this Thursday, Rethinking Peer Review for OER. That's at 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, everyone is welcome to attend. It's not um, limited in any way. So if you would like to join us, it's very informal. Each guest will talk for about five minutes and then we'll have a conversation much like we're having right now. And um, we'll also talk together as a community and hear for, from others about what they're doing regarding peer review. I can also find a link and put that in. Are there any other questions before we wrap up? Let's see, Ray is asking, Canvas Community Hub, which can be used to share instructor-created assignments, quizzes within an institution. Has OTN investigated if this would be something to add alongside an OER textbook available in OTN? Hmm, I think Ray, and feel free to step in and clarify, 
I think what you're talking about is that ancillaries problem and wanting to um, connect and provide more ancillary materials for faculty so that it's not an obstacle to adoption. And so we are thinking about that. We would probably shy away from using a particular LMS um, since not everybody has access to the same LMS, it could potentially um, not be open to everyone. That's one reason why having one complete portable file, um, there's a beauty to that because everyone can, can access that one file without needing um, any particular tool or platform. Um, but I, I think that's where you're going is, is really trying to find a place to connect those resources. The OER Commons does have um, ancillaries in their archive. And so um, one of my longer term projects would be to comb through what they have and connect it with what might be in the open textbook library as one example. Um, Heather's comment, they would need to vet the request for access. I was thinking of protecting from student access. Yes, that, that has been a sticking point. So I know the University of Minnesota Libraries um, they have uh, uh, ancillaries by request for some of the textbooks that they've published. And someone would need to, you know, point to their faculty or instructor affiliation at an institution in order to gain access so that it's not just openly available out there. Um, floating online and OpenStax does the same. Thanks, Jody. I love these kind of brainstorms. Are there any final questions, anybody? If not, then thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Karen, for stepping in literally at the last minute. Let's see. It would be nice if ancillaries were available through a sister site. Um, I want to encourage you to please come back on February 24th, which happens to be National Tortilla Chip Day. That's exciting. To hear Karen Pakula from Central Lakes College talk about her innovative OER learning circles, uh, which are a strategy to keep faculty engaged in open education initiatives. So come back then. Um, and as I said earlier, we will we have taped this and we will be putting it um, on, on YouTube and I'll be sharing that out um, on our OT and Google group and probably other venues as well. So thanks again for joining us, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tanya. And thanks all of you for tuning in and sharing your questions and ideas.